Okay, um, hi everyone, I'm Thomas and I run Coin of Sale, which is um, over the counter or system for over the counter uh, Bitcoin payments uh, used quite widely here in Singapore and in Europe and in other parts of the world, uh, most recently Canada. Um, I'm gonna talk about. I'll start with Bitcoin in general. I do a little bit of libertarian ranting on why Bitcoin, from my, uh, from my point of view, makes a lot of sense. And then I'll go to how you can use it uh, in, in, in practice, what to, what, what to take care of, what are options you can do, uh, and so on. So first, what is Bitcoin? Uh, it's three things, uh, or from my point of view, it's, it's cryptocurrency um, with, with one unit, Bitcoin. The difference there, which we in general use, is the with capital B system, with small b, uh, it's it's unit of a currency. Uh, it's decentralized payment mechanism to transfer those units uh, of currencies, and it's an open source software, which is quite important for, for what we will be talking about here today. Um, why crypto uh, in front of the currency? Uh, it's because the the issuance, the transfer, and the settlement of all the transactions. And, and the balance is, is upheld by, by very strong cryptography, public key cryptography that you know from other applications like PGP. Uh, that in practice means a couple of things. First, we know in advance how will the monetary base look, look like, how many Bitcoins will, there, will be out there in the next 10, 20, 100, 150 years, uh, which is important for the things I will be shortly talking about later. It's transparent because of its decentralization and because of the public ledger, you can look at any transaction in the history of, of Bitcoin. All current balances are basically a result of the chain of transactions which has happened before and which are stored in the, in the public ledger, which you can download freely uh, and which, which uh, distribution is necessary to, to maintain the network. Um, it's based on the public key cryptography, which means uh, every transaction can, uh, needs to be signed Created or and, and signed with the, with the private key, uh, not too different to what you're used to maybe from PGP, and uh, every transaction can be confirmed uh, with the representing public key or its hash. But we don't need to go into the, uh, into such details. Uh, you can Google it or, or ask me later why. Decentralization uh, is is very important for a couple of reasons. Uh, first that chart at the beginning will not change. Uh, in order for anyone to change the rules uh, defined in Bitcoin protocol, uh, he or she would have to take control of the majority of the network, which is a few tens of thousands of ser servers as we speak, uh, which is virtually impossible, of course. There are no two persons like this, whom you probably don't know, but who are two of the most powerful persons in the world, because every single day, based on their discretion, they decide what is the value of the savings of everyone uh, who uses uh, money in their, in their daily life and they, don't, they are not accountable to anyone. Um, another reason, and we can speculate here, but we can quite safely assume why the author of, of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, chose the decentralized model is uh, because of, of these two examples. Oh, what the hell just happened? I'm not gonna use the button. Um, of what happened to, to these two guys, or these two systems, Eagle and Liberty Reserve, who got, or which got shut down, uh, seized, and whose authors got, got, got vilified, prosecuted, and imprisoned solely because they were challenging uh, the, 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 the monopolistic uh, system uh, or, or the monetary system uh, based on the US dollar. Uh, so this cannot happen to Bitcoin. There's no one single server that can be attacked, seized, shut down, and, uh, and uh, all user accounts destroyed. Everything is on a public ledger. Another, uh, another upside of, of the decentralization is uh, there, there's no one who can simply seize your funds uh, because he's in the middle or he holds them. Uh, if, if you don't allow that, uh, the examples could be found in WikiLeaks or ProtonMail, which uh, fundraising accounts were, were shut down or blocked by PayPal and in case of WikiLeaks by, uh, by credit card companies. Open source, very important for, for us uh, being here. Uh, 
that means you don't need to ask anyone to do to do uh, anything different as long as you stick to the basic rules of the protocol of the basic cryptography principles you can do whatever you want you can bend the software you can cre create your own software as long as you sign the transaction the way it is supposed to be signed uh, you're you're free to do to do anything it doesn't cost you anything you don't have to ask for any sort of license uh, you just connect to the network uh, the same way as you connect to, to the internet even easier uh, the result being this is just a very tiny fraction of services and products that are available out there uh, in just five years of existence of Bitcoin. Uh, some of them are now valued at, at hundreds of millions of dollars, some of them are just, uh, are just starting up. And uh, again, it's because nobody had to ask anyone anything. Uh, so why should you bother? Uh, there are some ideological reasons which come from what I mentioned. Uh, and which brought me as a libertarian into into uh, into Bitcoin movement or Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. And then there are some practical points of view. So we'll get to that. Uh, from from that first point of view, the, this is how the monetary base of the U.S. dollar looks like uh, in the last 40 years. Um, there's a good reason for this, um, and that is how the inflation works. Whoever gets the money, the, the newly inflated money first. Uh, enjoys the old prices while those who get them last pay the most. So it's those who are connected to, to the to the system, to the state, to the government, who who uh, who are the beneficiaries of the of the inflating money supply, while those at the bottom, the middle class and, and the poor, uh, pay with the higher higher prices. The, the 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 reason for this is because states and governments like to finance what they like to do most, which is wars, police and surveillance state growing capitalism and giving giving away gifts to their friends. Uh, the implications, practical implications for us is the rising prices. Uh, this is my favorite example. The middle class car 100 years ago cost exactly the same, or used to cost exactly the same as the middle class car, uh, car costs now in gold. It's about 22 ounces of gold. Um, compare that to price in dollar, uh, it'll be many, many times more. Um, something different in Singapore as well. Um, another uh, reason, when you pump a lot of money into the system, that money tries to find places to go to. Uh, often uh, not very smart places. That's how mal investments are created. That's how bubbles are created. That's how uh, banks go into too much risk because they have just too much money lying on the ground, free and they are desperately looking for places to invest in, and that's how business cycle uh, is created. That's how, or, or um, massively and large, uh, that's when booms are started and uh, they end up in, in busts and crises like what we've seen uh, in 2008 and many times before, which are much, much worse than they used to be in 19th century during the, the period of gold standard. Uh, now to the more practical reasons, if you don't give a crap about what I was saying until now. Um, First, well, you can. You nobody. You don't need to ask anyone. It's free, literally. It just takes a little bit of time, a little bit of research, uh, getting familiar with some software, and you can give it a shot and see what is the result. Um, so, that's from my point of view, or, or in my opinion, quite quite uh, important uh, reason as well. But then, uh, fees are quite obvious. If you take care of everything yourself, if you if you use the free software that's available, uh, if you do the integration yourself, um, Bitcoin is free. Uh, the only thing it costs you is the internet connection, basically, or the you know, server space or whatever. Um, compared that to credit cards and PayPal, where you know, receiving transactions, those of you who run some e-commerce business uh, know about this, typical transaction will, will be anything between 2 to 5% with very small transactions, it can be even, long, even a bit more. Uh, if you use some payment processor for Bitcoin who will who will do a lot of stuff for you and make it extremely easy, then you might be charged something like 1%, still way less than what you are typically used to. Um, and then, you know, more down to earth uh, reason, PR and sales. Um, it's still a bit sexy for online media, for even often for traditional media to report on the new new merchants, new businesses accepting Bitcoin. Uh, either they run stories uh, from time to time or when it's you know announcement big enough, then they just run it separately. 
there's a big community in pretty much every you know, developed country these days or semi-developed country these days, uh, counting by by hundreds, uh, thousands of uh, people who use Bitcoin, who are willing to spend it. Uh, Black Friday, uh, this this last Friday was Black, Fr Black Friday, $260 million worth of Bitcoin was spent. That's what, 10% of, of current market cap? Something like that. That's a lot. Um, so just to give that into perspective. Uh, you can sign up on uh, on different online directories for free, uh, where people can search uh, for if they actively want to spend their bitcoins, then they can find you. Uh, it's also a good way to get to get a little bit of exposure. So now you know you need to use bitcoin, obviously after what I've just told you. So the question is how? Well, there are a few options. Um, I forgot to mention actually in this presentation, uh, now I realize payment processors, but you can Google that. They're super easy to start. Um, what I'll be talking about here, because we're on Hackathon, is how to hack it yourself. So how to how to do it pretty much for free. Uh, if you want to get rid of some headaches and, and just get quickly started, then you can go to, to payment processor, something like PayPal for Bitcoin, and, and you're done. So uh, the <coughs> full Bitcoin node is the original Original, it's been recoded many times before, and, and the, most of the code today is not original, but it's still, um, well, it, it, it emerged from the original code released or applied, released by Satoshi Nakamoto um, five years ago. Uh, and uh, it has it has a command, command line option, it has a, a graphical user interface, which to be honest, I've actually never used. Um, but for us, trying to integrate it in, in the app. It's the, the command line and the remote protocol connection uh, that we're interested in. Uh, it has few advantages uh, and, and reasons when do you want to use it. So first, uh, it allows you to receive uh, and to send the transactions. Uh, there are many options how you can receive the transactions. Uh, the thing about full node is that you can also send them straight from the server. So if you need some sort of application which requires uh, receiving and sending with, that you are somehow connected users on both sides of the transaction then that's what, what you might want to want to use uh, it has an internal accounting system which is very handy uh, which I'll be talking about uh, later uh, it has many advanced uh, options and, and functionalities uh, like multi signature which is uh, which allows for for much uh, more advanced security uh, or uh, it can send one transaction to many uh, many addresses which saves on fees and, and uh, can be used in, in other ways uh, together with the internal accounting system usually. Uh, it has a remote JSON API uh, which allows to send commands or to receive information about the, the wallet, the balances, accounts or about the network in general and there are many many language specific APIs which, which connect to this. Uh, yeah, just mentioned it. Um, so what are, uh, there are disadvantages in using the, the full node. Uh, first off, you need to download the full blockchain, which currently is about uh, 30 gigs of data. Um, if you're running it in, the v in VPS, it'll cost you a little bit of money, uh, if you're running it locally, it'll cost you a little bit of you know, disk space. Uh, uh, there are ways how to get around it, and I'll get to them as well. Um, you can't run two instances uh, or two wallets on the same server, uh, which kind of sucks uh, because then, for example, if you if you don't have separate testing environment, if you're just starting, if you have a staging environment. In, in your VPS, uh, then you need to somehow distinguish the accounts if you run internal accounting. Uh, again, there are some tricks uh, around it which I've tried and I'll, I'll explain them a little bit later. It's fairly easy. Uh, the most important probably is security risk. Uh, this way your private keys are on the server which is directly exposed to the internet and um, accessible by uh, by uh, a potential 
hacker. Um, so you need to take care of some precautions which might or might not work. Uh, and there, there's always a potential of losing uh, some money and you need to minimize that. Um, I have a lot to talk about that. Um, okay, so how to set it up. Um, download, so you download binary for whatever you're using. Um, when you're using Mac or, or, or Windows as a, or, or Linux as a development environment, then you just download that, and then for your server, uh, you, you download, if you're using Windows as your development environment and Linux as your production environment, you download both. They're perfectly compatible, of course. Uh, there are separate binaries. There's also a source code if you want to compile it or if you're using something exotic. Uh, the binary is fairly small. Um, there's uh, there are a few there are a few binaries. There's a daemon which which you can run, uh, which you can then connect to remotely, and then just recently uh, the client itself, which you can use to to connect to the running server to the running wallet, has been put aside and is now a, a separate binary. Uh, so if you download it, uh, there are a few of them. It's fairly easy um, and fairly clear if you if you uh, Google it how they work. Uh, if you just run the daemon, uh, the 30 gigs of data takes ages to download. I'm not sure, honestly, how is it in the US, for example, where there's, or Europe, where there's much more servers that, that the, the node connects to. Here, when I, when I launched a new server, when was this? No, sorry, when I reinstalled my laptop, a couple of months ago, and I thought I would just run it from the scratch. Um, after like five days, I was on at about in about the halfway through. Uh, so it's insanely long these days. Uh, so you need to speed it up. Um, and the easiest, or probably the only way, is to torrent the latest blockchain bootstrap. Uh, there are updates once in a while, once in a few months, uh, available on Bitcoin.org. Uh, Bitcoin oh, sorry, Bitcoin.org. Uh, the easiest way is just to Google uh, blockchain bootstrap or, or, or torrent blockchain or something like that, and it'll be for sure the first link. Um, you open the, your, your torrent client, it downloads, and there are instructions you just copy to, to the Bitcoin directory, uh, and uh, the Bitcoin will, or the, the Bitcoin node will automatically note that there's this file available and it will import it and make it much quicker. Um, so typically the file will be maybe a few months old and then it will take maybe just a day to to, uh, to get up to the current date from, from that snapshot. Uh, so this is important step to get rid of a lot of headaches. Um, you run Bitcoin Daemon. Um, if you want to just run it on at the background, you use Daemon uh, flag. Uh, this is quite handy if you, for example, like myself, have a development environment with SSD drive with just 160 gigs of data and you don't really want 30 gigs of that being taken by, by uh, the blockchain. So what you can do is to, is to put the blockchain uh, on the external uh, drive. That means whenever you want to run that, you will need to have that external drive. <coughs> with you uh, and running with the same parameter. On the same path, the wallet will be stored as well with all the private keys and everything. So, so the whole directory that Bitcoin uses in order to, to run and to save the configuration will be somewhere else. Um, so it's important to, to, to note, but when you, when you remember it and when you have the drive with you, it saves 30 gigs of data on your internal, um, internal, uh, on your internal drive or on your primary environment, which might be handy for some people. Um, when you run Bitcoin, uh, the, the, the node first time, uh, two files will be generated. Uh, the, the configuration file with some default, uh, default settings, including the, the, the default randomly generated password for remote connection, and uh, the wallet, uh, which is a binary file storing uh, the private keys. Uh, there are some important steps to be taken later related to security, we'll get to them. Um, 
So you can change the RPC password to, to your, if you want, store it somewhere, and then you, you use it in, in whatever app you want to use it with. Um, so now you have the node uh, running. The node is typically connected to other nodes around. Uh, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's decentralized. Uh, so it looks for, for the, the, the closest nodes uh, around you, connect to them. Uh, I, to be honest, I don't know even how many. I think it's around 10 that it typically connects to. So whatever transaction happens or is relayed from your node, meaning your system sent some, some sort of transaction and sent it to your node, that will be automatically sent to those that it connects to. Uh, and they will relay it further. And this way, of course, it will be everywhere around the world, typically in, in a couple of seconds. Um, yeah, it's a, if you want to... Well, if you want to connect to that node remotely, it's a must to set SSL, of course. Uh, if you connect locally, it doesn't matter that much, but uh, you might want to do it anyway. Um, by default, the node doesn't allow remote connections. If you want to connect from, from remote computer, computer, you need to uh, set it explicitly in the, in the configuration file. Um, so. OK, integration. Well, Basically, I started with that, but uh, to take it further, there are two options how you can integrate your app with, uh, with the running node, uh, which then allows you to send and receive the transactions. Uh, locally, via, via command line and Bitcoin client, if you prefer that for whatever reason, um, I think better option is to simply use the, the built-in uh, remote, uh, remote protocol and uh, use the, the either generate it or, or the password that you change. Uh, there's a default uh, user username which you might use or change. Um, and again, use SSL or not. Um, this is, in my opinion, the, the preferred version. All APIs, or at least those that I saw, uh, language-specific APIs I built are built around uh, the RPC. They don't, by default, or that they, they don't assume that you are using the, the Bitcoin binary client. That's useful for, for your, uh, if you're looking in, in, in the app yourself through the command line, then you use the Bitcoin binary. Um, yeah, so if you want uh, the, to run the integration with, with, with the language that you're using, then you just Google, um, uh, sorry, e even if you want just to use the, the Bitcoin client in order to connect to the node and to do whatever you want there to get the information uh, about about the transactions, just Google uh, this string, the original Bitcoin or query, uh, the original Bitcoin client API calls list. Uh, it'll come up first and there's a full list of commands. It's pretty clear what, what does it do. Um, and you just need to decide what you need for, for your your purposes. Uh, yeah, I mentioned this. Uh, Language-specific APIs uh, are implemented pretty much the way they, they just call uh, these standard calls. They use the same same name, same syntax. Uh, they just tr translate it from from your language, uh, whether it's object-oriented language or something else, uh, and they translate it into standard uh, API calls. It's it's it. I don't know. It's insanely easy um, when you when you look at it, when you think about it, when you run it. Um, there's just no reason not to try it. Um, the accounting I mentioned. This is the the interesting thing about 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 the note, um, and it might be one of the main reasons why why to use it despite of the downsides. Uh, so what it what it allows you to do when you receive a transaction. Uh, or when you're supposed to receive a transaction, you, you always create a private key and the, and the representing address. Uh, you typically you ask the the note, you ask for the address. You don't ask for the private key because you're not interested in that. That's important for the wallet in order to do transaction. But for for your user in order to send you money, for example, he needs to know the address. So typically you ask for a Bitcoin address. That's that's the representing string that is used to identify. Um, you um, or, 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 or to give some in, in identifi identification to someone who's, you, who's sending you uh, some balance. 
so you ask the node by command to give you a new address and you can specify what account that address should belong to. So when the money arrives to that address, it is specifically linked to an account which you can name however you want. Uh, this is great for double checking whether the payments are going where they're supposed to, whether there's maybe accidentally something extra and, and you need to figure out where the hell is it. Uh, and then when you are sending money away, you can do, you can do the same thing. You can just uh, specify the account uh, the money is supposed to go from. Uh, so this way, uh, it makes it super easy for you to, to maintain the correct balance at any given time. Even if you screw up whatever in your database or, or the code, the, the node will always make sure the balance is correct on the node as long as you don't play, uh, as long as you don't do some monkey business with, with those, with those uh, accounts themselves. Uh, there's always a main account which uh, you specify with well, just empty string, um, which can be used, for example, for, for cold storage. We'll get to that. Uh, and that's the only account that can go to negative. All other accounts, if you try to send something from the account uh, and there's not enough balance in that account, it throws an error and it doesn't send the balance. The only, um, so how it works in practice, and, and this is very important for the, for the cold storage. Let's say you have uh, 10 accounts with different names and then you have the gener generate empty string main account. Uh, you can maintain the balance on these, but if you don't want to have too much money on your server available for the hacker, then you just send it out from the main account. Uh, account. Uh, these remain untouched. Uh, the main account goes to negative. Uh, then, of course, you need to handle with the situation if someone wants to withdraw from one of these accounts and you need to let them know that you will send it later from somewhere else. Um, but this is, this is uh, the important thing in order to a, keep your balance manageable on the server, and B, to still keep uh, records of how much your users uh, do have, uh, how much balance do, do, do they have in their accounts. Um, and you can, what you can do is, is you can move balances in between accounts uh, with, with no fees. So uh, typically when you send a Bitcoin transaction, it'll typically charge you some very small fee. Uh, but when you move balances in between your internal accounts, you don't need to do that. The, the, the node takes care of it very seamlessly uh, without, without any fees because no real transaction actually happens within Bitcoin network. Everything happens within your accounting um, or, or within your settlement. Uh, so what you can do, for example, if you want to save on fees, you can send just one transaction a day, for example, to many addresses from many accounts. Uh, or just from, from the main account, and then you can do the settlement within your wallet with no additional fees. So you will pay fees only for one transaction. You send trend, 10 transactions away from one account, and then you settle it internally uh, with, without sending anything and paying anything to the, to the Bitcoin network. Um, so that's, that's the beauty about it. Uh, then, of course, it's it's nice and uh, recommended to do to do reconciliation uh, with your with your database. Uh, I personally trust Satoshi and people who followed him more than I trust my programming skills. So I know I do mistakes, uh, and it's good to have this backup uh, to find out that I've done some mistake in uh, handling transaction on my end, and I can actually compare it to uh, compare it to what the node uh, maintains. Um, cool, security, we think. The moment you have the private keys on your server, they're exposed. So first thing you should do is to encrypt the wallet. So even if someone gets into the server, finds the file, copy, copies it over, he will not be able to use it because it's encrypted with a password. Uh, that of course means that your programs, the program somehow needs to know the password or you know access the, the wallet uh, in some different way. Uh, so you have two options, uh, both of which I've seen in different applications. Uh, maybe there are more, but uh, in my experience, these are two uh, main that, or two that are available. A through the command line, you can store the password <coughs> in the memory for a definite amount of time. 
uh, defined in seconds. So you can store it for a day, two, or a week, or whatever, and just refresh it periodically. Maybe change it uh, from time to time. The user that runs the Bitcoin node will have the password in, in, in the memory. Uh, so in order for someone to actually steal the password, he would have to dump the memory and know exactly what, what, what he's looking for. Uh, that's quite tricky. I, it's not impossible, but uh, it, it makes it much more difficult. Um, or then you can, of course, if you, if you run uh, compiled code, then you can just uh, place the password in the compiled code and, and, and it's, uh, it's, I don't know, probably almost a, uh, as safe. I use the first option. Uh, I know people uh, having a lot of money on, on their servers running the second option and it's been working for them quite safely so far. So I think it works well. Um, of course, when you, so if you use the first option and you set the password through the, through, uh, uh, the bash or the command line, make sure it's not in your history. Um, so any hacker can just look it up there. Uh, one important thing, even if you get a security breach and you get your funds stolen for whatever reason, just remember uh, the node always creates 100 addresses in advance. Uh, this is for the convenience of the backup, so you don't need to do a backup after every transaction. It, it generates 100 private keys, uh, in, stores it in a pool, and then just goes through them. And when it uh, reaches some threshold, it generates 100 more. So that means if your wallet gets wiped, uh, just don't send it to next available address because the hacker has that address as well. The first thing you need to probably do, at, at the very minimum, of course, is to generate 100 addresses or to wipe the wallet uh, clean. Uh, but at least to generate 100, 100 addresses, so at least until the hacker gets into it next time, um, he doesn't he doesn't get uh, access to whatever funds you sent to to that regenerated pool. Um, the safest thing, for example, at least for uh, for amounts above something that you're willing to to lose, uh, is cold storage. So uh, running some regular scrape, which will check the balance of. Uh, of your wallet, uh, and when it reaches some threshold, it just sends it somewhere safe, somewhere you know, that is on, on your laptop or on a hardware wallet or paper wallet. Um, you need to, of course, handle it in, at the back end and front end. When user wants to uh, withdraw his funds, if, if he stores his funds with you, um, then you need to let him know that sorry, there's not not this amount is not available in, in, in the hot wallet, so I will send it from the cold storage a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, this is the safest way how to make sure that uh, you minimize whatever damage is done on on your balance. Okay, so much more safer, and if you are willing to not having some 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 uh, functionality, even more convenient and easier to run uh, option are so-called deterministic wallets. Deterministic because they determine both private keys and public keys from one master key or from two master keys. Uh, what does it mean for you are two things. Uh, you can have your or even your user's wallet somewhere else uh, safe, or fairly safe, at least not exposed directly on the server that is online. Uh, and just using one string, which I'll show later, you can generate addresses which will be recognized in that wallet. Even those are completely at a different places, they don't know each other, or they don't, they're, not, they're not integrated. When you generate an address from that master public key on your server here, and the balance is sent to that address, the wallet somewhere else has the same set of addresses, typically five or 20 in advance, and it notices that hey something was sent here, uh, and it, it, it'll show it. I'll, I'll show I'll show an example later. So this is a great way to to receive payments that you don't that don't need to reside on the server, um, don't need to be sent straight away. That, that you just want to have somewhere safe, but still you want to know know about them on the server side. Um, so yeah, I mentioned it's only it's when you when you want to only receive. 
uh, or if you're willing to in implement some, some sort of delayed sending uh, on the server, so you will let the user know that, hey, sorry, I don't maintain the wallet <coughs> on the server or the balance, so it'll be sent uh, a bit later uh, from, from the cold storage. Uh, private keys are not exposed on the server, and your users, if you're running the service for your users, not for yourself, they can have their own wallets. You don't have access to their private keys. There's no risk of you losing their, their balances. Uh, they don't even have to give you any access, no private keys, and still you can generate addresses that will be available um, for, 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 for them. Uh, so there are three types of, of these deterministic wallets. <coughs> Electrum, which is the most uh, basic one, it's very simple, it's very lightweight. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't download uh, the full blockchain, so it can be run pretty, pretty immediately. Um, and uh, there are, I call them APIs, but they're not really APIs. It's more the implementation of the, the deterministic algorithm uh, that, uh, that Electrum uses in order to determine the addresses. So uh, you can use it in whatever language uh, you use, um, and that way you can generate addresses that will be visible and available for, for the Electrum that is sitting somewhere aside. Um, Actually, I wanted to show examples. Will I show them at the end? I'll show them at the end. Um, second is Armory, which is uh, running on top of the full Bitcoin client, which means that it downloads the full blockchain. Um, but it's very, very heavily security focused. It has many security features. It has a cold storage and the deterministic wallet. Uh, I had been using it uh, for, for a long time before. I bought a hardware wallet, which I'm using now, um, which is using, this hardware wallet is using, is using BIP32. So BIP32 is the latest generation of, uh, of deterministic wallets. Let me show you this hardware wallet. Um, and uh, it's hierarchical deterministic wallet, which means it not only can determine addresses in, in the specific order based on the algorithm, but it can also run hierarchies. So sub-accounts and sub-accounts uh, on, on multiple levels. Uh, this allows you, for example, to separate uh, accounts of your of your users, of your clients, or when we're talking big company, hopefully in the future, adopting Bitcoin for their um, you know in, internal balances and transactions, they can use just one device like this or whichever software a wallet will implement Bit32 and they can have separate accounts and they can even allow some people to be able to manage whole tree or and some people to manage only separate accounts uh, or some people only to see separate accounts not even be able to, to transact so there are many ways how you, how you can play with it and, and it's, 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 it's beautiful implementation um, and there are already some implementations running and there will be much more. Many, many uh, existing wallets and wallet providers um, are already working on implementing this. Um, coin of sale or uh, we, we implemented it in, in our, uh, our system as well recently uh, in order to provide our users uh, possibility to, to use either Electrum or this device or any other Bit32 wallet with our system. Um, the only thing that you need for, for this to, to work is that whatever wallet uh, implements BIP32 needs to also expose uh, the extended public key which is used to generate those addresses, which not all of them do. Right now I know only about two. It's this, Bitcoin Trezor, that's Bitcoin Safe, and uh, one Android uh, wallet. It's called Wallet32, I think. Um, there are a few other wallets which have implemented this, but they don't expose the extended public key yet. Uh, Hive, for example, which is a US and Singapore-based uh, wallet company, um, they, they, uh, they are a bit 32-based, but they don't expose the public key, which means you can't really use it for, you, for your users or for yourself. So, um, But they, they, they said they would do it. So uh, the, the support is growing, and uh, we'll get there. Uh, and yet, there is no blockchain required in, with any of these, uh, which is great.
Um, okay, before I get to that, I'll show you those three examples uh, using uh, kind of cell. So I have uh, three uh, outlets, like three stores, or I call it coffee bar and restaurant here. Uh, all of them with three different setups. So the first one uh, uses, uh, I'll open it, uses the uh, internal wallet or a single address. Um, so what I'll do is I'll sign in as staff, okay. dollars so live transaction yeah what did you expect that's that you can send it if you want <laughs> uh, with that contrast it's freaking god damn it oh wait I didn't hear it at all <laughs> okay, that works. Cool. Um, yeah, you can't see it, but it shows uh, well, Liberty Coffee, the name of the store. Uh, yeah, but actually, you could, you could have shown that as well. Um, so this contains, you can't scan it because of the contrast, but the QR code con contains a few things. It contains the address, which is like a bank account or whatever, uh, the destination where the balance should go to. It contains the label. So in my case, in case of or our case, in case of coin of sale, it includes uh, uh, the name of the store and the original um, price in, in the original currency, uh, and it contains uh, the amount in bitcoins. Uh, so in this case, it's 0 0.0971. Oh, sorry, 10 point. Okay, so um, yeah, it, it uh, the. It always contains bitcoins. Uh, the world has switched to millibitcoins in the meantime, uh, but the, the QR code always needs to uh, contain the, the, the bitcoin price. Uh, okay, so you, I hit send. Whoops, no, I did it. I hit the wrong button, sorry. So I hit send. That's it. It's been paid. So now I can check uh, this is the command for uh, listing Bitcoin transactions from in within the full node. Uh, as you can see, this is what I was talking about, data there and it's pointing to my external drive so I don't waste 30 gigs of my of data on my internal drive and list transactions. So it lists the last uh, 10 transactions in the in JSON format, uh, and this is it. So account, uh, address which it was received to, type of transaction received, amount in Bitcoin, zero confirmations. Confirmation is a process of uh, placing the transaction in the block, which is then added to the block blockchain. It happens on average every 10 minutes. Before the first confirmations, uh, that amount is not spendable. You need to wait for for the transaction to be uh, to, to to get into blockchain or to, to, to the first block in order for it to to uh, follow or to, to, be, to be spendable. Transaction ID always a hash like this. Uh, time in, in seconds and time epoch. And uh, so. Oh yeah, this is time sent and time received. So usually it will be the same. Sometimes they might be uh, one or two seconds difference. Uh, okay, so this is how it looks like when you send it internally. Now I'll switch to a different account. Uh, so just to show you, okay, I'll go straight to the third one. And third one is tied with Electrum, which I have opened here. So. Uh, what it will do, this is this is how the master public key looks like. It's a 128 long string, you can see it here, wallet master public key. So 
we just copy and paste it from, from here to here in case of my system, of course. Um, and that's it. Um, and now uh, I internally store the latest index or index of, of the latest transaction. So I don't look from the beginning, obviously. I know where, wh when, when the, or where the last transaction happened. And then I just generate the next, uh, the next address. It's good to make sure that that address hasn't been used for whatever reason. Maybe the user uses the address somewhere else. Um, okay, so I'll go to to this. I'll sign in with the outlet code and the pin. You know what? Every time when I saw someone using uh, a numpad on a laptop when he had keyboard, I was laughing my ass off. Like, why the hell would you use that and click with the mouse when you can? use buttons. Since I've implemented I do the same. I don't know why. It's just some weird reflex. Okay, uh, so now this generated an address for the electrum. So now check out what happens. I'll send it. So this turns green and look at the bottom. New transaction received into electrum. So electrum immediately noticed that the transaction it was watching, or the, the address it was watching, has received some balance. Uh, now they are on the same computer, of course, but under normal circumstances, or if I was doing it in my production environment, which I could, um, these would be two completely separate instances. So whatever happens with the server, the balance remains somewhere else, fairly safe, uh, or at least disconnected from, from the server balance. This can be your wallet or it can be your customer's wallet. So this is a testing scenario of a customer having his own Electrum wallet and not having use me as a, as a transactional intermediate. So he uses me basically only as a service, as a website, but he receives payments directly, uh, which is good for me because I'm not exposed to security risk and good for him because he receives payments immediately. He just needs to pay me invoice backwards while when he's re when I'm receiving payment from him directly then I can just deduct the transaction fee and send him the outstanding amount uh, while this way he needs to uh, I need to send him invoice and he needs to pay preferably um, okay so this is Electrum and the third is uh, is pip32 so I will actually set it up uh, right now it's set to internal so I'll change it to BIP32. This is my testing Trezor. Uh, so you can see four accounts here. Uh, if you open advanced details, here are uh, account public keys. <coughs> so this is equivalent of what you saw for for uh, for Electrum, uh, but they are, they are with the separate account, uh, or there are separate accounts. Uh, so I'll use, uh, which one? fourth one for example no I'll use this one for reasons I'll tell you in a second okay it asks me to check whether the first address is this so uh, say I checked it don't watch Confirmed. Now, um, you can see that this, ac this account has been fairly heavily used already. There's a couple of dozens of transactions. So uh, what, I, what you will see now is, because I don't know that, uh, at least not now. So what I'll do when generating first transaction, I will check one address after another to see if they've been used. I'll find out that they've been and I'll, and the system will, will continue going until it finds the first available address. So it'll take a few seconds for the, for the QR code to be generated first time. <coughs> this is very rare scenario, by the way. I just wanted to show you too that this can happen as well and it's important to take care of.
Done. And now when I go here, see the transaction is already here, unconfirmed. Just received. So um, yeah, this is this is it. Then you can. Uh, um, so what I do here, I assume that the user takes care of his accounting himself. I don't try to do that for him um, because this makes just more sense. Uh, if he has, uh, I have users who use Trezor uh, in in Canada and Europe, and they have different um, uh, they have different outlets. So what they do is they they set up a separate account for every outlet and they place these uh, public uh, extended public keys in in, uh, in uh, every outlet. They can do it. They can use just one wallet, uh, but um, yeah, however they prefer. Anyway, that's specific to my system, so I don't want to talk about that. Uh, so yeah, these are three ways how you can receive uh, the payments. Uh, only one of them allows you to send them away, of course. So it's something you need to uh, take into consideration. Um, okay. Awesome. I'm almost out of time, uh, so that means you will not find out that I'm totally lame when it comes to Bitcoin 2.0. Uh, so I would love to talk about Bitcoin 2.0 for another two hours, but I don't have time. Uh, it doesn't mean that I don't know shit about it. I don't. So anyway, uh, what's Bitcoin 2.0? Uh, I'll tell you what I know, which is not much. Um, what I've been talking about mostly until now is the monetary impl implementation uh, implications of Bitcoin um, and, and how it was designed as a media of exchange, uh, a currency or a money in the future, the universe will accept the media of exchange, hopefully. Um, what Bitcoin 2.0 uh, means uh, is um, decentralized applications, very specific applications uh, called also app coins. You might have heard about altcoins. Uh, which are just different currencies. They have no specific purpose, uh, no specific application other than being different currencies, and I don't see any value in that. Uh, I think these specific applications make uh, much more sense because they can solve, they can decentralize different, uh, different uh, exchanges of information, asset, uh, asset, um, you know, just accounting, balancing, uh, and and uh, do it very specifically for the industry they are they are designed to, or they can do decentralized governance. There are amazing projects out there um, which try to, or, to 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 do something like that to to do decentralized uh, um, company, you know, incorporation or 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 stock exchanges, uh, marriages, divorces, probably later. Um, and so on and so forth, uh, and uh, or, or pro defining property rights in decentralized ways. So there's no centralized institution which which needs to maintain it and which needs to be well, uncorruptible or or uh, can can go down. Uh, so these are some some great applications. Uh, there are names out there like Mastercoin, like Ethereum, like Counterparty, uh, Ripple, which have very grand vision on providing frameworks, um, uh, which I don't really understand. Um, some of them reside, some of them run their own blockchains. Some of them reside on top of the existing Bitcoin blockchain and just uh, add, a, add a layer uh, to that. Um, you, I know a bit more about some of them, but I'll be very honest, I don't know much. I'm, as, as, as an Austrian economist and someone who came into Bitcoin, interested in the value of the media of exchange, this is what I focus on, I just want to bring people the, the ability to use it to, to transact, but there are some very, very, very smart people trying to uh, achieve something different, uh, some, some, some decentralized governments or, or, or governance or other things, and uh, I think it'll be, it'll be super exciting to see these things work out. Many of them will not, but those that will do will be, will be great. Uh, as a, a friend of mine, and again, we go, an investor in these app coins uh, have said on a conference here in Singapore and many times before and after, what can be de decentralized will be de decentralized. And this is what Bitcoin 2.0 is, uh, is all about. Um, okay, uh, thanks. Here's my, not my, 
contact info, you will not be able to scan that. You can follow me on Twitter or Facebook. There are a couple of things I wanted to just point out. First, all of you received a bag of goodies. Uh, there's um, a paper wallet provided by, by well, Technic Asia and Data Access. Access provided. Oh, access provided. Yeah. Um, so you, David checked it, and actually almost none of them were swiped. There's money in it, just a little bit, but there are. So uh, if you install some Bitcoin wallet, uh, either either uh, Android Bitcoin wallet or Mycelium, you can scan the QR code and swipe that wallet, and you will have a Bitcoin balance. So. On the left side is the private key, so I'm going to cover it so you can't scan it. <laughs> but that's how you scan and that's how you get the money out of it. So download a wallet, it has instructions on it, and it's provided by the local community uh, group called Access. The local business group called Access. About a dollar sixty on it. You should, you should have told that. Why, it's not worth it. <laughs> but they even got searching for bags now. But, I mean, there were, yeah, there were a couple hundred of these uh, given away, so now you know it. Yeah. It's up to you how you take advantage of it. <laughs> if you don't use it by mid-January or late January, I'm going to sweep it back out. So. <laughs> um, I'm not joking so either. <laughs> that's the first thing. Second thing, um, if you are interested in, in, uh, in, in this and in doing this as a job, uh, Idbit, one of uh, larger local companies uh, in Bitcoin ecosystem, is uh, looking for a tech person taking over uh, some activities in Singapore, support, maybe some development. I, I don't know too much of the details, uh, but you, you can ask over here. And uh, yeah, if you're, if you're interested, just raise your hand. And if you're interested, uh, you can get an interview or something. Um, yep, if you have further questions, just reach out to me and uh, hope you start using Bitcoin. See ya. Thanks.